Hello, everybody. I'm Matt from But Why the Podcast, and I'm here with Jason Flat. And today we're going to kind of do a bonus episode on Assassin's Creed and some of the religion and other parts of the, I guess, lore of the game. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Super, super excited. So, to get started here, um, can you tell us what your show is? Because I know you're a podcaster as well, and why you were interested in this topic. Yeah, well, so I do a, a podcast called Holy Star Wars. It's about doing comparative readings of Star Wars with different myths and legends from all around the world uh, through particular moral and deep thinking themes. Like I, I just did one on anticipation and talked about how that theme it, it pertains to episode seven and a, a, a short story. So uh, how I come into this particular episode of your show, I mean, I'm a huge, been a huge Assassin's Creed fan since 2007 when the first game came out. I've played almost pretty much every single Assassin's Creed game, including all of the Chronicles games, which you got to play them. Everyone listening, try those games out. They're so much fun. Um, only one I haven't played is the newest one, Origins. And uh, I've always loved specifically the the really funky, convoluted lore that's in the modern day part of the game that a lot of people sometimes just skip over and forget about because it doesn't make a ton of sense unless you do a ton of reading about it. And so I've always loved that. <laughs> and I always, you know, love the just storytelling and, and these deeper morality themes that Assassin's Creed as a series has always been really big on. I know. I mean, that's kind of why I want to do this as well. <laughs> so everybody, when they think of Assassin's Creed, and especially when we talk about the religion part, they always think of basically the Templars are usually the, you know, hyper, I guess, uh, religious bad guys, and usually the assassins are almost these, like, atheist good guys. But today, we're actually not going to really talk about that, per se. And we're actually going to talk about, which, as he was saying, the modern day, that's kind of a background story of when you're not actually in the Animus, even though you see some of it in the Animus, of <clears throat> basically the Itso Itsu, I guess it's Itsu, Itsu civilization, which are basically known as the first civilization in Assassin's Creed. And kind of go through there and kind of how that relates to everyday uh Religions, I guess, per se. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess to we'll start off with, I'll give you. We'll start off with some background on this. The Itsu, the uh, or the first civilization. Is it Itsu or Itsu? I don't even know exactly how to. I know it's spelled Itsu or Itsu. I've said it so many times. <laughs> um, Not a hundred percent sure. I think I've usually said with the like the tss, the like it's Itsu. Itsu. Okay. Yeah. Ancient language, it's been lost for thousands of years. We can't know for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, the Itsu are basically known as the first civilization, Abstergo, in the game. They classify him as Homo sapien divinus, or divinus, which I'm assuming means, uh, obviously, humans in modern day are basically Homo sapiens. I'm assuming divinus mean divine, like as in they were divine humans. And they were known as an ancient and advanced uh, species of humanoids. And the main thing they show about in this game is the DNA is a triple helix structure. And in in, as anybody that doesn't know, humans only have this, what's basically called a double helix structure. It's basically the way your DNA model works. And I don't know how else to actually explain what it looks like, but it's basically a helix structure. And you have to Google it to look it up. Um, and they also have this thing called, they have an additional uh, sense. Basically, it's called knowledge which is weird because they just have this sense called knowledge, but that's what they call it in the game. That's how it is. And they are basically long-living humanoids. They're highly intelligent. They basically highly evolved. I believe they believe they said they're from Earth, and they just actually evolved. And what they did throughout the game is they're actually the creators of mankind uh, and human sapiens, which we are now, along with some other species in the uh, homo or humo genus basically like that's like the primate genus if I'm correct mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're also the creator of Neanderthals have you ever heard of Neanderthals and they actually designed those to be <laughs> like military and expendable workforce so all this creation of like humans and Neanderthals were basically to be slaves and workforce just I find I thought was fascinating for one you have this ancient civilization that basically created humans and nobody apparently knows about them in their game and so how they created them is they actually removed the sixth sense from the humans and other characteristics they basically they're always they're genetically altered them 
because like I said, they're advanced. And so they wanted, they designed uh, Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal to be basically inferior species. As we said, domestic workforce. They changed their DNA and everything. And the way they controlled them is by these pieces of atom. And the one in particular that we'll probably talk about a lot today is the atom. No, excuse me, the apple of Eden, which is brought up throughout all of the games. And this piece of technology. And basically what they used to control uh, the humans. And basically how it's interpreted to me is, and from what all the research I did, was it's the ability, this apple interacts with the neurotransmitters within the brain that allows them to be controlled. So they have no idea what's going on or anything else. Um, for those of you not aware of the pieces of Eden, basically they also, there's other ones that do various different things, such as weapons, healing, raise the dead, all types of like, I guess they're almost like supernatural technologies as how we would think about them. <clears throat> There's one that's like this, like, lantern or something. I remember too from, it was in the, the, the Dead Kings DLC in, uh, in Assassin's Creed Unity and it was just like a fire that never stopped burning. That one was a cool one. <laughs> Actually, I have this funny thing because you brought about those and you enjoy them, but I actually have not really played any of the Chronicles, which is actually kind of sad. But I just, I, they're, a lot of them are like on MOBA, or like, I say MOBA, mobile games, and I'm just not a big fan of mobile games, so. Yeah, the, the, all three of them revolve around a particular piece of eating called the, the Shroud. And I can't remember the, the total details about it, but I would definitely, like I said, check those games out for anyone that's got got the the itch. They definitely add a lot of stuff to the game, from what I know, and especially it's cool for all the different uh, civilizations across, like they think they go to India, China, Russia, and so forth. But anyway, so back to the thing, so basically after these humans uh, been the workforce for centuries for the Itsu civilization, basically what ends up happening is over time they kind of evolve and actually they end up uh, start interbreeding, and due to this interbreeding between, as they call it, the human and gods, as in the Itsu, uh, they lead to these hybrids, hybrid humanoids, in which the neurotransmitter becomes absent or it's just non-controllable and doesn't work anymore. And so over time, eventually they actually lose control of the humans, and so they revolt. They're like, oh, they actually come, I guess, they grow a conscience and have some knowledge, and they realize that they're being enslaved. And so they revolt. And it's funny because they actually use the story of Adam and Eve in the game as basically Adam and Eve broke free of... They were like the first humans, or excuse me, first hybrids to be able to not be in control. Eve broke free and then basically rescued Adam. They stole the piece of Eden that was the control of the apple and basically started this giant rebellion. And this lasted apparently for a long time. It's basically a long century, and I don't think centuries, long world, war, but a very long time. Until what they had was called a Toba catastrophe, which led to a mass extinction. And apparently this was happened in space. They, apparently the way they say it in modern times during the game is misconceived as a supervolcano, which obviously scientists today have seen that, you know, supervolcanoes occur and they basically shoot up a bunch of ash in the ground with block out sunlight, which can cause all these mass extinctions. But they say what actually happened that you'd miss within the timeline is a, basically called a coronal mass injection or also known as a solar flare. And so it shoots off a lot of radiation. And what this solar flare did in the game was it actually flipped the polarity of the Earth or the magnetic fields. And by doing so, basically the Earth climate and stuff changed super fast, causing, which probably would cause a massive volcano. I don't know if, are you familiar with any of like, I guess, old polarity or, I know that's kind of not really. <laughs> I actually, I actually spent a bit of time not that long ago reading about, um, like, atmospheric cells and how that relates to the polar to the polar uh equators and it's some super complicated stuff that i somewhat started to understand um but like it's it's it relates to how like different biomes exist on planets and it's really cool actually because like if you look at a map all of the all of the deserts that go across the map will like be in a straight line and then it'll be all temperate and then it'll be all deserts and it's actually really cool because it's based on like you know the equator 
and the way that the Earth spins based on the the poles, but then also like the way that the air moves because the the atmosphere moves because of the poles. It's like super cool stuff. <laughs> That was actually very impressive. I wasn't sure if <laughs> I wasn't sure how much you were actually gonna know about that. That's actually very impressive. Because <laughs> tend to do that on uh, but why though and stuff. They basically Kate and Adrian are the co-hosts. Just stare at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but anyway, so basically, this flip of the polarity or the poles in the magnetic field uh, caused all this climate a mass extinction. Well, basically, do this. If mass extinction, we say, as in a lot of, like, species went extinct, but not every single one of them. Usually what occurs is about 90-plus percent of the species gone extinct. Well, humans in the Itsu actually do survive, and they realize, they're like, oh, well, I know we've been at war for a long time, but there's probably not that many of them, so they actually work to rebuild the world. But the Itsu were these long-living and intelligent creatures. They were too decimated because one of the characteristics that usually takes on in biology is the longer living you are and the more thing, um, the longer living you are and kind of advanced you are, the less you are of reproduction or the longer time it takes to like mature to reproduce. And so because of this, essentially they became extinct because they just didn't have the number to, to keep up. Which is also why this war actually, which was fascinating, because why this war actually went so long and the humans actually had a chance. So you'd think, oh, advanced technology, we're doomed. But the thing was, Itsu didn't have the, really the numbers, even though they had the technology and the knowledge, they basically built millions and millions of humans. And so it was just like a, basically how they built them, expendable workforce. So when they fought, they're like, oh, we don't care if we lose 10,000, we have 10,000 more. <laughs> Probably a horrible way to look at it, but that was literally essentially what they did. I mean, that's kind of how they build some giant work. Yeah, excuse me. There are other ancient wars and other times that have fought like that, which is probably a terrible strategy, but sometimes numbers just do win. Sounds like ancient warfare so, to me. Yeah. So that's some good background on this. I just want to tell everybody so they kind of get caught up to know exactly, like, what civilization we're talking about, how the game portrays them. Um, and, you know, kind of what actually happened to it. Especially them. since most of y'all who played the games probably skipped all that stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's actually something where you see it, and you're like, oh, this is weird. And, like, the biggest reveal to me is, like, in Assassin's Creed 2, where uh, Juno, one of the, uh, I believe it's Juno. Yeah. That, oh, no, it's Minerva. 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 Yeah, sorry if I pronounce, mispronounce her names. She actually talked to uh, Ezio at the time and mentioned Desmond's name, and you, like, freak out. And you're like, what? Yeah, she, like, talks on? to Ezio... That's Ezio. She talks to Desmond through Ezio, and Ezio's just like, who's this Desmond guy? What are you talking about, Cre creepy ghost lady? But then Desmond comes out of the whole thing and just like, <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, it's really crazy. So you do realize, but it also is something that much as a big part, it just seems to be always in the background. It's those small little like parts and scenes that where if you're not paying attention, you can totally miss it and not realize what's going on. It's also one of those things they throw a lot of the... Uh, I guess it references to them in a lot of the emails. So if you're the person that doesn't actually come out of the animus that much and actually checks like all the like computer emails that they have laying around, you might never actually read some of this stuff. Or if you like, which is weird because there's also I'm there's, sorry, there's also ahead. in uh, all of the Ezio games they have the like. Um, I forget what they call them, but there's these puzzles that are, um, when you go to certain landmarks, you use your eagle vision and you do these small little puzzles, and each of them, as you com as you complete them all, they unlock some sort of part of that bigger mystery. Like in, in Assassin's Creed 2, when you do all of them, you, first of all, each of the puzzles shows, like, where the Apple of Eden was in each piece of history, and, like, all these other pieces of Eden that actually come up in later games, but that you see for the first time in these puzzles. And then um, at the end, when you do all of them, you get this short little video of like of that of the escape of Adam and Eve from the first civilization. Yeah, it's, it's like, really cool. I think it's part of the codex from uh, Subject Sixteen, I believe. is It's a codex he embedded in the yeah. Animus, so it's a, that you have to solve the codex. You have pieces for people to find because throughout the game, because basically the way Desmond and Ezio were able to actually one use the pieces of Eden and um, obviously talk to the Itsu civilization because they're actually their bloodline they have like their DNA like f like up to like 5% DNA found in them and so that's how they use their bloodline to be able to contact and use these pieces and the subject 16 had a very high amount that he was able to like control some of this stuff and interlink obviously with the animus which is also why he went insane but <laughs> ah. 
So saying all that with this ancient civilization, because they go extinct, and in the game, they mention, and they kind of, because it's cool, because they talk about, they use kind of science in a way. Obviously, a lot of this stuff is fiction and everything else, but they manipulate it off of this. Uh, and if you ever looked at evolutionary biology, you'll see there's a giant time gap of, like, this unknown what happens between, basically, the evolution of humans. And so they kind of try to explain this mass extinction area in the Itsu, whatever, as this time gap of what happened. So that leads to this other part, which I find interesting in a comparison to this thing, which is, I'm laughing now, but it is something that's kind of cool to listen to, but I don't know how you feel, but I feel it's kind of absurd, but it is interesting to think about, of uh, ancient astronaut theory. <laughs> I've seen <laughs> I've seen several an episode of Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. I feel everybody's seen a, at least a picture of the guy that does Ancient Aliens, <laughs> oh, yes. but obviously very, an episode or two. Memeable. So for those of you that basically live under a rock and are not familiar with this, it basically says that they're E.T., or aliens, extraterrestrials, visit Earth a long time ago and help the humans that basically evolve and do a bunch of different things. And they use, basically, a few of them actually believe that aliens did the same things that Itsu and created mankind, but more of it just kind of the extraterrestrials, they came, they visited, they basically made contact, they helped them develop their cultures, their technologies, their religions, some of them want to be treated as gods and per se, like, and some of the examples they use were how they built the pyramids, Easter Island, some of the tools they say for cutting some of this stuff, the Ark of the Covenant, a lot of different texts they show that, uh, uh, hieroglyphics show, like, pictures of, like, what they say is helicopters, which when they start, to, I'm, I've seen some of the stuff in some of the hieroglyphics, the pictures they show me, they're kind of like, I'm like, eh, that's <laughs> kind of a stretch you're going with here. But, yeah. And so, and also what they use is uh, the fact that there was a lot of these ancient cultures, you know, because they didn't have really, I mean, they had boats, but they weren't just traveling across the ocean in planes. They weren't hopping on, like, American Airlines and flying across the ocean back in the day. But, like, their pyramids found in Egypt, South America. They all seemed to make temples, and they all kind of had, like, the similarities. And they had this understanding of mathematics, astronomy, despite, like, never meeting each other, per se. So, yeah, that's basically the <laughs> summer summarization of that. Um, I don't know if you had anything... That I missed on that. I mean, just <laughs> another exa- another example that I like that I've came ac- across recently is that there's certain types of there's certain myths in cultures that just are like there's no reason in the world they should have the same myth as each other. But another one that I just found out about recently is um, there's all different island peoples all around the world, like from Polynesians and like Hawaiians to people that live in the Canary Islands all the way in the like off of Spain have like almost the such similar myths about the deities that they say live in their volcanoes and it's just like <laughs> such uncannily similar stories but there's like no reason to believe that those people had contact with each other like the polynesians did not migrate to the canary islands that did that did not happen <laughs> and so like at least not as far as i know but like when you hear the just like those kind of stories are just it's it's so cool how how for some reason people on complete opposite sides of the world came up with the same things at the same time yeah no it's totally fascinating like as much as i'm like i think uh, obviously carl sagan then wrote a book on this a long time ago like what if this happened i mean for a lot of it seems especially with the evidence presented it's kind of absurd and everything and your thing but then you start thinking about it like well this could be possible in some ways. I mean, there are stuff that you, like, look at, and then there's other times where, like, okay, come on. The movies about it but make it seem plausible. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say, but it's definitely... I'm cool. So, I bring that up because, obviously, I kind of want to compare the Itsu and the ancient astronauts and this whole thing, some of the similarities. Obviously, this, you know, what they, when they I'm sure when the game creators were creating this, they took some similarities, but some of the... So, uh, and the differences because they knew about the theory but some of the things where the biological description were, was about the same of what you see anybody that's seen Indiana and the uh, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull basically that's how they kind of described them they had these larger skulls, they were taller your generic like uh, aliens I guess if you want to say, as they always depict them it seems like, obviously advanced technology, they had pieces of Eden versus spaceships um a few of the differences was Itsu, they say, are actually from Earth, and they just evolved over time. And so eventually that's how and came that event versus ETs, which obviously means extraterrestrials, so they came from space. 
and it's who went extinct, obviously, versus ETs, which is one of the biggest things why I kind of like definitely question this is apparently they just left. I don't really know what the whole thing is of why they say these ancient astronauts came, did all this stuff, and just randomly left or something. I don't. Maybe they. Maybe know. they. That's the biggest puzzle. Maybe they predicted the same Sorry. mass extinction that actually happened, and so they were like, "We're piecing out before that happens." Yeah, I mean, that, hey, that's very plausible. <laughs> even, even though I don't think cause that's what the funny thing is, because out of all the mass extinctions, humans haven't been a part part of any of them. They might be the cause of the next one, most likely, <laughs> but they haven't actually been a cause, been around for all the other ones. But I guess yeah, yeah. that's been the biggest question because I get it. Like, okay, some of the stuff I get you, but why why would you just leave and that's it? So, big thing. Moving on from there. Here's where we kind of get into the big meat, because that first part was just kind of some background, so everybody kind of knew what we were kind of diving into, how the lore portrays it, and whatnot. And so, kind of what I really want to talk about is basically, over time, humans, the way they portray it in the game, and also it seems to be some of the questions that come up along the lines in today's actual religions and everything, is where do, I guess the lack of understanding is how I like to put it, but basically humans don't know everything. And so, basically, people that can't comprehend things tend to, like, replace them with, like, you know, as in this case, gods or something. And so, how they do it in the game, per se, is the humans lack the knowledge, and, but they had to actually try to give it to them, just as a fun fact, as they were dying off. But they just failed. It didn't comprehend with their genetic, uh, uh, their, their, excuse me, their double helix DNA. And so, they needed that triple helix. They couldn't get it. Obviously, you can't just alter again, whatnot. But anyways, so the humans couldn't c comprehend the Itsu at all because they didn't have that sixth sense of knowledge, and so all they saw them as as gods, because they're like, oh, these people, you know, they do all these amazing things. They give us life, everything. And so all they thought of them as gods. But they never actually knew what they were, and over time they actually didn't even know they existed. And so it actually, but the funny thing was, because they thought of them as gods, it almost like, I like to call it a legacy type effect. I don't know if there's actually a proper name for this thing. But essentially the names of the head of like the leaders of the Itsu and some of the characteristics and the characters, they actually, that played a role, like Adam and Eve, which we'll get to here in a minute or so, they actually lived on through time, despite the fact that humans had were unaware that this civilization even existed. And then... A lot of the religions they talk about in the game and that are made throughout the world uh, basically were based on, on some of the aspects and misinterpretations of the Itsu. Um, as I said, the characters such as Juno, Jupiter, Minerva, they actually had other, uh, they actually had multiple names that fit different cultures, which kind of why a lot of the religions had a lot of similarities, which as you said earlier, like all these cultures that never met each other have all these same myths, and they're wondering where all this came from. Yeah, so if anybody ever knows about Greek and Roman mythology, you know that, like, Jupiter's actually a god. And so I didn't write down some of the other names they had, but basically they depicted them over various different cultures to mean the exact same characteristic, or characteristic, characters, and based their religion off of these things when they're actually almost the same exact stories. <laughs> and they're all a variety of, essentially, the story of the Itsu, but they still have no comprehension of that these people even existed. And I find that fascinating, at least to me, I don't know how you feel, kind of like how you talk about the, the island people that have the same story, that basically how this can actually happen. I don't even know if, is, I know you talked about on your podcast different, I guess, religion type stuff in Star Wars. Can you see a reason, I guess, of why things would have like similar stories? I know we... Maybe the same gods just did visit everyone. Yeah. <laughs> like, in the, <laughs> like, in, like in Assassin's Creed. But I mean... In re in in reality, you know, I've I, a long time ago I read up on some of the different theories of like why are there pyramids and you know why did the Incans and the Egyptians build pyramids and the biggest the best answers people really tend to have is just well there's only so many shapes of buildings you can build you know and there's only yeah, that's true. you know I mean, when you see a when you see a volcano and you see you know it's erupting and it's there's there's it turns everything into ash and 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 fire is everywhere and it, you know it elicits these same feelings to anyone of like anger and wrath and destruction and so when you're going to make up a story about you know ex trying to explain why the why the volcano erupts then you're going to tell a story that has probably some similar themes just because of the fact that it elicits a lot of the same feelings in any human being 
I didn't even think about that, honestly, for something. Volcano, I think, is actually the great, uh, great example, because it's definitely, they're obviously found all around the world. And they are kind of forming a triangular pyramid type of shape, without the top, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so as we talk about some stories, I also want to talk about, the, in particular, this is my favorite story in the game that I'm about to talk about. It's basically the story of Eve. And I like to say, one, how it's, what the game portrays is the actual story of what actually happened. And then I like to talk about the Christian version, because it's one that's brought up a lot in the game. And obviously, just in general, if you've ever met somebody Christian, people know the story. And also, just how different, drastically different they are. And then the possibility, and just even what ends up happening to the story. It's crazy. So in the Assassin's Creed version, the story of Eid, she basically is an Itsu human hybrid. She's the very first, basically, hybrid that cannot actually be controlled by this neurotransmitter or the Apple of Eden but because her neurotransmitter, like, failure of some sort. She basically then becomes actually the human, uh, the leader of the human rebellion, as in almost literally the first assassin uh, ever. She rescues Adam. They steal this Apple of Eden to escape, lo and behold, Eden. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's like almost to the humankind, you would think she is just you know, this great hero, you know, she basically brought him from out of slavery. But then when it comes to the actual Christian version, what most people know of the story of Eve is basically she disobeyed God. The Itsu claimed, as they said, um, she disobeyed her parents, as they said, or the, her creators. Um, she, as they say for the, she ate the apple, even though they used the apple of Eden in this case, but the, she ate an apple from the tree of life, knowledge depending on other ones, and commits basically original sin. Also found it fascinating, which is kind of funny in the story, that Adam, at least in my opinion, seems to be both useless and just always along for the ride <laughs> and doesn't really seem to be doing anything. <laughs> but I just, I find that story, at least obviously the way they do it for both versions, just because they're so tra- drastically different and it's definitely just a... I guess as you call it, perspective of how who, who you're taking your perspective from on whether she's actually a hero or she's actually basically the worst, in some cases, the worst human ever made, as in she created original sin. Yeah, it, the thing that I think is super interesting about it is, like, yeah, in the Bible, the story is about how Eve was almost, like, coaxed into taking the apple fraught by, by the serpent, who... In Christianity, is representative of, of Satan, and in Judaism or in other religions that do the same story, it's just the serpent just just was like, hey, you know, Eve, you should do it. Knowledge is cool. You should have knowledge. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to try that knowledge thing. And she tries it, and then she's like, yo, Adam, try this knowledge thing. And he's just along for the ride, too, pretty much. But he's, he's complicit in it. But in, uh, in Assassin's Creed, it's almost more like the story of Prometheus, um, in Greek mythology, where there's a, this this noble aspect to it, where like Prometheus was like, "Yo, I love humans. I really want to help them out and do them a solid." Or even like, um, um, what's his name in in Moana? Um, uh, you know, wow, I feel uh, terrible. The Rock. You know? the rock. <laughs> the Rock. Exactly. The Rock. But uh, <laughs> um, but I can't. Uh, is it Maui? Maui. Is it Maui? Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, these, they, gods who, they, in for themselves, they're like, yes, I really want to make sure that I can, you know, help these humans out. I'm going to steal the fire, and I'm going to bring it to the humans. And just like, you know, Eve is like, I'm going to steal the apple of Eden, and I'm going to take it out of the garden, I'm going to take it out of here, and I'm going to make sure that it can never be used against us again, and that it's only that, um... You know, there's this noble aspect to it that over time, you know, as as humanity had developed this their own religions around this story, they painted Eve as the bad guy, um, which is interesting too because the Christians who, who in some sense, made the story what it is as we know it now, um, are in the game the Templars, and they want to paint these the the humans the runaways as as the bad guys because they're they're kind of on the side of the the Isu that want to keep the humans enslaved and all that complicated stuff. But it's the same with like with Prometheus. Prometheus, where like he was just trying to do something good, but the other gods were like, "No, we're punishing you." And it's, you know, he was trying to do something good, but they painted her as the bad guy later so that history could could put her put her to shame. Yeah. 
no, I, I don't know why. I just really love that story because of the, that whole thing. Especially, like you said, just how she ends up as this horrible bad guy when you're like, she literally freed humanity. But, um, which also leads to the next part of basically, as we, she said, she stole the technology or the serpent said gain this knowledge of, they need knowledge because the story change, and so these stories of myths and miracles or supernatural occurrences, because, as we said, Apple of Eden, if you have no idea, and even the other ones you're talking about, the Shroud, people don't really understand them. And so this goes back to, like, probably one of my favorite uh, quotes, which I think we've used before on But Why, though, is magic is just science we don't understand. <laughs> Because <laughs> throughout the game, the pieces of Eden, they're like, they, they say it's just magic, and they obviously they don't know, and they don't know why. They're like, oh, this thing just looks shiny, and it does awesome things. <laughs> but uh, this lack of understanding, you know, they're like, it's supernatural, it's a miracle, and everything, and it's literally just technology that was made by another civilization. And I guess the real question that I really want to know, in your opinion on it, is like, why do you think mankind defaults lack of understanding in this type of thing to, like, the work of the gods? Because that seems to come up a lot. I think that in a lot of ways, it's kind of just easier. Something that I was taught in high school and I took a philosophy class was, like, similar kind of vein of how, you know, magic is just science we don't understand. Philosophy is just sciences we don't understand yet. Um, was, and... It's sometimes just it's easier and it's more entertaining and more tangible to attribute these these unexplainable things to something that like magic, where while magic itself is entirely like you know or, or you know these gods and ancient ancient religions are are not real and they do crazy you know magical things, at least there's a definition to what that magic is, and if you can apply you know this unknown thing to this definition then it at least makes you feel safe and secure in what it is that you're observing and what you're seeing because while you might not understand it you at least can define it yeah i think the humans humans or mankind like need to have to feel like that whole security and that want to like we need to have a reason for something and if we can't understand it we're just going to make something up i yeah totally agree that's great <laughs> <laughs> i forgot about philosophy though that is another thing how philosophy bends itself into that and some of that stuff can definitely get very interesting. <laughs> uh, which leads to this other thing that uh, I want to talk about within this whole thing is the Itsu, basically, it comes up a lot in a lot of these uh, religions as well. I think Christianity is another big one, especially throughout the game, that goes with the Itsu made humans in their own image, or they made in our own image to make humans. That's what Itsu, how they portrayed it. And then... Basically, this made in our own image concept comes up. You hear it in various religions and everything. And humans tend to depict a lot of their gods in their own image. And this whole, I guess, idea that you can be close to the gods or that the gods are among us, they look like us. I guess the funny one is basically, I guess, like in Roman, I believe it's Roman or Greeks, depending on which one you want to, or how, they're almost the same, depending on <laughs> how you wanted the name apply. But the actual sex sexual reproduction with humans which is funny because it's you end up having this hybrids because you have like these uh now i can't demigods which are happen to be half thing it's who are the same gods too <laughs> yeah pretty sense. much and you're like yeah um excuse me uh try i feel like you almost like moving around trying to get everything uh i guess do you have uh, any thoughts on, like, why people want this whole, like, made-in-your-own-image? I mean, I guess I get the whole, like, they want like, they want the gods among us to look like us. <laughs> to me, at least to me, the way I've always, I guess, thought or believed is, like, I literally think it's you, because I, I think it's just a sad way to justify things that you want, so you can say it's just like you, so you're always correct and right, <laughs> per se. Yeah. If that makes sense. When you, when I first was thinking about, you know, the issue created the humans in their image, um, it's that's that's straight out of the first chapter of the Bible in, in Genesis that God created mankind in, in God's image, and it's 
in, in, in my religion in Judaism, it's an extraordinarily important tenet of, of life is that, you know, each one of us is made in the image of God. And so when I first started thinking about that idea of like this, who made the humans in their image, that's where I, that's where my mind first went. Um, but there's the, there is the reciprocal part of it where when, when human beings try to depict God, they depict God in their own image. And I think that it's part of it is the, that, that reciprocation of like, if God created us to, to look at, to be in God's image, then that means that we, that means that God must look like us. Right. But you know, when you, I, I, I personally think that, you know, the image of God thing means more, you know, the meta, more of a, not, 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 not what you look like, but like the metaphysical image. But so, it's easy, I think, when we're, when we're talking about how do we depict gods, we, I like what you said. I like, I like that idea of like, you know, um, if we can attribute those stories to, and if we can attribute those stories to, to these beings that look and act just like humans, because in Greek and Roman mythology and in most mythology, um, you know, the characters aren't just stagnant, flat characters who never develop. They all have deep, deep flaws, and that's to be flawed is to be human and um right generally we can when we think about you know god in terms of like christian god god is an is infallible um you know omnipresent being that or, or not being but you know that is uh that that can do and does no wrong versus when we depict god in the in, in our own images we can we can feel as though hey you know we make mistakes, but so do the gods, because the gods are just like us, and they look like us, gets and act like us, and and make make all of those humanly mistakes. I like it. <laughs> you did cut out though a little bit, so I did miss the tail end, but that's okay since you are recording, obviously on your own end. <laughs> Towards the no, tail end. That's, yeah, that's why we, that's why we do that. <laughs> yeah, that's also why we do both too. Yeah, <laughs> but no, very well said. Which I kind of want to end up with this before we kind of, I guess, wrap up with the final, like the final concept that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I feel like the best dialogue that represents this entire situation is between, as we talked about in that vault series where uh, Minerva was talking to Desmond. But before that conversation, the best dialogue happens. Ezio basically goes, you are basically the god to her. And she was like, basically, no, not gods. We just simply came before you. And the look on his face and the comp- the lack of comprehension is just it. It's, his mind is completely blown. Of like, I don't understand this. <laughs> and she's literally just stating, "I live before you." That's all it was. And it's incredible <laughs> because from that moment, he spends the rest of his life seeking to understand what it is that he experienced in that moment in the uh, you know in the in, underneath the underneath the Vatican, where he, he's he spends the entire rest of his life committing to the assassins and committing to discovering what is it that i what is it i just saw <laughs> who yeah is this no Minerva? it's great yeah i think that's what great because that's why this whole like also another reason why as we talked about like defaulting to the work of the gods like it's awesome because you're like why well, is unknown thing that i really want to understand he just dedicates it and he keeps learning and stuff and just that determination and i guess drive to try to understand and learn is awesome to me i think it's just fascinating huh. And so the last thing I want to really talk about here through this whole thing is it's played in a lot of the games and played a huge role throughout the entire Assassin's Creed series. And I just want to kind of go, because I think the first one really hits on it really well, especially at the, towards, at the end of the game, but this concept of free will. Um, basically, as we said, the Itsu be- built this Adam of Eden to control and enslave mankind. Obviously, Eve steals Adam to grant kind of like free will. He, she basically frees the human from being controlled to make their own choices. And the way the game portrays it, and obviously, not your personal opinion, but mine, I've also seen, like, just growing up times, that seems like religions do this whole thing of the ability to control people. Basically, the few gain the power of the masses. And it's really portrayed very well at the end of Assassin's Creed 1, which I'm going to butcher this name, and I apologize. Al Mulin or Al Mulin wields the apple and tells Altair all the legends and religious mo- mysteries in history were just merely illusions. And then it says, she basically says they were made quote unquote real by this apple for then people to believe all these things. 
And as you talked about earlier, kind of the this controlling thing, which is interesting because also throughout the, the game, because they talk about we're trying to do good by controlling people because we want peace on Earth. People should have no free will or choice. Or excuse me, people will have no free will or choice, but there will be world peace. And it's kind of... Kind of how you feel, it's just weird, because you're like, okay, well, we get world peace, and that's great, but then it's like, well, what about, I guess, human choices? Because I believe uh, in that game, uh, Altair basically responds to him like, because Amon basically says, you know, there people are doing violence in the name of these gods, in the name of these stories, you know, we need peace and whatever, to, you know, and, and he's like, these aren't real, and Altair basically responds, well, they may not be real, but they at least have a choice to believe in this. Exactly. And I just, that's, I, that is a, I thought it was a very, probably by that moment on, I was like, this game is, like, this series is probably one of my favorites ever. Exactly. Because <laughs> it, was, it was definitely, like, straight, a lot of things. I don't know, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, should we take world peace as sacrifice? I mean, it almost goes into the whole thing with, like, liberty, too. Like, do you want freedom, or do you want, like, control? I mean, it's, I mean, world peace, yeah. would you give up world peace for no free will, I guess? That's the the crux of the whole the whole game <laughs> i think at yeah. the very end of the last piece we were just talking about you know the the knowledge and um what i what i see a lot of is that the assassins they they think that you know they they have their their creed that they say out loud and i forget the whole thing but the last line is you know everything is accepted and it goes to that notion of like no it they're we don't need to control. We don't need to control any, any, anything. Everything is accepted. Everything is possible, um, and the only way to be able to achieve that is, you know, Eve needed to steal the apple. Eve needed to Eve, Eve needed to take the knowledge from the Garden of Eden. Needed to take that this ability for humans to think freely and to be be their own individuals in order to allow people to to live and to to allow everything to be accepted. And so the whole the whole fight between the Templars and the and the assassins in between Juno and Minerva is all about, you know, exactly. Do we need to control people in order to make sure that they, you know, is be can they only be free if we control them and make sure that they're free, or will they? You know, is it possible for people to be able to, you know, live perhaps bloody, battled lives between civilizations and you know, there's these horrible <laughs> things, but at least we're free to make those choices ourselves and not have someone else controlling it for us and yeah i mean this yeah. <laughs> this series it makes you especially in the later some of the later games assassin's creed 3 and um assassin's creed 4 and in rogue make you think a lot about you know maybe actually the templars are right they really do like make you play as templar characters and make you think yep. about um you know from their point of view they really just they just want to make sure that there can be a world that their children can live in without fear of being being killed or being persecuted or being, um, you know, poor or anything. They just, they just genuinely, for the most part, their motives are in the right places. Not everyone, you know, the, the, uh, the Borgias are like just power hungry, crazy people. Yeah, yeah, the Borgias are definitely like, just power. <laughs> I like to think of, of, uh, that, that Hawthorne, I think that's his name, the, uh, you know, uh, Ken, yeah, Kenneth Harth yeah, Hawthorne? No, yeah, the one who's, the one who's, yeah. Edward's son, but Connor's Connor? Is it Connor? Maybe Connor. And that yeah. you play as in the very beginning of AC3. I, th I, tend to, I tend to sympathize with him somewhat because he, you know, he came upon the Templars not because he was some evil maniac. You know, his father was a, a huge person in the, in the Assassins and, uh, you know, some of the most important people in his life were Assassins and he came upon the Templars not because he was evil and wanted to rule the world but because he genuinely just wanted to be able to protect the people he loved and cared about you know his his uh his, his father was like wasn't his father wasn't his father murdered in front of him or something and that's how they connected uh, the community. i, think, I, don't I remember. can't remember but basically exactly like how his he's died. just like no <laughs> i just want to i just want to protect my family like <laughs> i just want to make sure that everything's all good yeah, no, it's definitely interesting too how the game does do that whole like at the towards the like in the later games you do start playing as a Templar, and it has that whole thing, and it's it's weird because you're kind of like, because you kind of at least to me, especially question some of this, you end up flipping. I mean, at least thing you seem like you want to flip sides because you're like, well, they, they literally just want to do good, like you said. 
But then you're like, well... But um, then you're like, oh, yeah, but actually, <laughs> Abstergo, who's now become, you know, Abstergo Entertainment and as, you know... Yeah. Actually, their CEO is an uh, awful person who just wants to rule the world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You see this whole, like, because even that's what uh, Amalam was doing at the end of the one. Like, as much as he was talking about the priests on Earth and everything, he literally, as you walk through the end of the game, you see everybody in this trance state because they have no, they basically no control. They're just, like, trance yeah. state going through the motions. He just literally wanted the power. I, just, I think about it. What if the people who were the big bad guys in the games, you know, Borgia and, and the Abstergo people, like, what if they weren't evil people with bad motives like would would you be able to sympathize with them even more in their you know the way that they believe the world you know that that there's this sort of determinant that there should be this sort of determinism over free will where the, we shouldn't ha have have choice over things things should just be made to be correct correct quote unquote yeah which yeah yeah <laughs> which is actually interesting because obviously i didn't bring up right here and have the thing but there is a codex i think they use from one of the subjects who said that the itsu kind of had this like kind of deterministic like betrayal of future events and everything throughout history and i don't remember whether they were right or wrong but it was interesting to yeah. look at that as this advanced and like in uh, ac4 so. or so i think is when they were like using that there is a skull that they used to put it into a map and it like shows here's all the places that these temples exist and they're there to make sure yep. that disasters don't happen and to warn you when they're going to and that's why like all these major earthquakes in history happen is because they're the the pre the, the the temples are there and people yeah something like that yeah which is funny because you're like because the whole like because this whole time it's like they're fighting for free will and then you have this choice but then it's like well the itsu literally already have this deterministic off of technology kind of what's going to happen <laughs> somewhat I'm definitely interested in just how these last few games between Unity, Syndicate, and Origins, which I haven't played yet, how they kind of bring on the next chapter of this this whole tale. Because after the after the whole end of the world was averted, and you know Juno does the whole evil thing, and Minerva and is trapped in the Matrix basically, and um, in AC three, right. and then between AC four. In all of the subsequent games, there was like they kind of dialed it back in the series because they knew that one, it was really confusing, but two, that yes. they knew that they didn't want to just abandon it. So they slowly, over the course of the last four or five games, have have just given little bits of like that the the issue the issue stuff. And um, I'm really curious. I'm, I'm fairly confident that HC Origins has a whole big like reveal of what happens next in terms of that story because. Um, there was a whole bunch of just like small bits but really cool things that happened with regards to like Minerva trying to get Jert and Juno trying to get out from the Matrix and they were all trapped inside and they're like help like help Isn't us her... we're trapped we're, we're pretending yeah, to be good her, her, but like, we're evil dead husband the yeah same. and I can never yeah. remember which one's the good guy and which one's the bad guy between Juno and Minerva or if they're both just bad uh one of them's good one of them's bad remember which one's uh, which. I think Juno's the bad yeah. one if I remember correctly now I, I think can't so. think off the top of my head <laughs> But uh, I don't know, because I haven't quite finished Assassin's Creed Origins, but so far, I don't know if there will actually be any of that in there. If there has, it hasn't come up It usually up happens at the end so of these games lately, so... Yeah. I was, that was the one thing I did not like, per se, is they kind of... Because obviously the story wrapped up with Desmond. As we talk on our episode, I kind of break down the first five that we're kind of going over. But this whole part of the game seems to be lost with just, like you said, the little sprinkles of it. And especially when you play Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed 2, and I think Brotherhood, and so forth, this is like a huge part of it, and a lot of like shocking stuff happens, and then it just kind of goes away, and you're like, it's still there, but there's really nothing more than just like a little sprinkle of like, help me, as you said. And I was kind of like, help me, yeah, like help me get more information on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, come meet me but, in the back alley of the, of the Abstergo building and feed me this data, and I will help you, wink, wink. Yeah. Also, it's funny, by the way, just a, uh, I guess, side note, talking about Abstergo and how big and powerful, I feel like uh, Abstergo's going to be, like, the real world, the real, Disney will be the real world version of Abstergo one of these days. <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, definitely. For those of you unaware, we are recording right before Star Wars. And right before the, the whole Fox deal is supposed to be announced, potentially, on Thursday. Yes, and the Fox deal. 
So basically right before Disney going to make their move to become real world Abstergo. Well, it's funny because Abstergo is intentionally like they, they – Ubisoft is like making fun of themselves as a corporation. Like their headquarters are in are in Montreal and they – the Abstergo's headquarters are in Montreal, and they have kind of similar names, and they've they've done this whole thing on purpose to like poke fun at the whole like evil corporation thing by just making their evil corporation basically themselves. They even make video games in the games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. That ends up being like the last one where you're literally just like player one. You don't have a you're not Desmond or anybody. You're just player one. Um. So yeah, that's about all I had on this like long story or anything. I don't know your final thoughts of anything or. I would just say, if you're listening, this stuff's really complicated, and there's so much to know. But like, I, it, I would recommend to, to to go back and replay some of the older games if you get a chance, like with the Ezio collection, um, and you know, watch some YouTube videos at the least because it's really cool stuff and makes you think a lot, and I think makes you appreciate the rest of the game, like the stuff that's the meat and potatoes, a lot more just for understanding some of that complicated background stuff. Definitely worth the while, I think. Yeah, I would probably have to totally agree. The first few games are obviously my favorites. If you've ever listened, if you listened to our previous episode on but but why though, when we do this game, I love the first few games. I love this background stuff. I find it uh, very fascinating. I find this story fascinating. I obviously I know they picked from like actual real day stuff, but just like how they relate everything to like current like in real life actual things like whether it be some of the religion aspect to it or basically pulling from this ancient astronaut theory type stuff or just even using some of the science like in the course of evolution like said between solar flares and everything I just I find it awesome and it's also one of the things you can think about like to, uh, overall of just like maybe there was an ancient civilization <laughs> who knows but uh, you never know but yeah um but that's about all I had for this. Uh, I thought there was one more thing. Nope. Uh, but, yeah. So, Jason, I just want to say uh, thanks for coming on and doing this. Thanks with for me. having me. Very glad to do it. Uh, thanks. Um, and so I guess we'll go ahead and close everything out. Um, uh, as I said before, I'm Matt at Brum But Why Though, the podcast. And you can find us at But Why Though PC on Twitter and Facebook. And, and you can email us at info at butwhythopodcast.com if you have any questions or anything about that. Jason, where can everybody find you? Also, go buy their T-shirt. It's a great T-shirt if you're still selling them. Yes. <laughs> we just added new T-shirts, actually, from our latest I was just wearing episode. mine yesterday. My mom asked me what it was, and I was like, oh, let me tell you. And she was like, I don't get it. But I was like, <laughs> okay, I, you don't need to, but it's fine. Um, yes, we just made a new T-shirt that we leaked today, basically from our prequel saying Anakin – is the Nickelback. <laughs> yes, Wars. I did see that. <laughs> um, yes. Not a prequel hater. But, yep, you can find me. Uh, my podcast is Holy Star Wars. You can find us at Holy underscore Star underscore Wars, as well as you can find me at Flatter underscore Y-O-U. That's F-L-A-T-T-E-R underscore Y-O-U. It's like my name. Um, as well as uh, all over RetroZap.com, where I'm a writer. And, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. And as we ask all of our guests on But Why Though, which I will continue considering I made this entire part at the end, what would you like the outro music of this episode Going to with be? with Fly Like an Eagle because, you know. Fly you know, Like an Eagle. Eagle Vision and, you know, like uh, the leap of faith and it makes the eagle sound. Eagles are super important in Assassin's Creed. Fly Like an Eagle. I've been thinking about this for the last that hour trying great. to decide. And honestly, that is something that what I would have never would have guessed. 